Hey everyone, thanks for checking out this video. Today I'm going to be building a dark academia style magic school to replace the magic realm headquarters in Glimmerbrook and I'm going to be discussing the Ludum possessions of the 1600 which, spoiler alert, involved a priest that was so dang hot a little priest got jealous and tried to kill him and succeeded in killing him because corruption. So that's a really big spoiler, sorry, but I promise it's an interesting story. Uh, so it's a good time to mention that if you do enjoy this build and stories about super sexy priests and witches and demons in general, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you too can join the Beckett Towns of Sim Society for thoughty supernatural history. That's my pitch. I hope you accept it. The subscribe button is on this page. <laughs> So first, I would like to give you guys some information about this build. Uh, so it doesn't use any custom content, but it does use like every single pack available because I've got no self-control and I cannot pack limit myself. So this is meant to be placed on the Magic Realm headquarters lot in Glimmerbrook, uh, which starts this life as a sad gray box with barely any magic. Uh, just tears, and so I'm going to be reincarnating it into a more happy, more irregularly angled box with lots of big happy magic and fewer tears. <laughs> To edit the lot, uh, or to place it if you download it, you're going to need to use free build mode. So if you don't know how to get there, that is accessed through the cheat panel by typing in bb.enable free build. My magic school is inspired by dark academia vibes. I think I said that before, but uh, basically it's got everything a magic student could want to pretty much live there. I build it this way because... Um, when I play a spellcaster, I basically force them to master all their magical skills in one long marathon master realm session. Master realm? Magic realm session. Uh, so there's a working kitchen, bar, dining hall, dormitory, so your sim never has to leave. Uh, I put in classrooms for all the different magical arts, although I can pretty much guarantee you that these sages will never show up in the right spot. Um, there's also a really dope library uh, and plenty of other things your sims can use to skill around campus. So if you like this build, you can find it on my gallery, which is Becca Town Sims. And uh, let me know if you like this and want to see more dark academia magical style. That was hard to say. Uh, it took a stupid long time to make this thing and uh, I had to cut the video footage down substantially to make it a watchable link. So apologies if it's abrupt or spinny in places. Now, onto the fun part, demonic possessions and witch trials. So, today we're going to be mind traveling to 1600s France. Just imagine it with me, the cottage core, pastoral fields, the beautiful medieval architecture, the cool clothes, the religious intolerance, the smell of witches burning in the air, yikes. Yeah, so it gets rough pretty fast. So the hero of our story is named Urbain Grandier, and he is a real life, honest to goodness, 1600s hottie apparently so i googled his picture i don't know if this portrait that you'll find is contemporary or if some guy like whipped it up after he died uh but the picture is less flattering than real life accounts would have me to believe i mean he sounds like really hot and some people just don't photograph or portrait well that's just a fact so people said that uh grandier was hot so picture somebody real hot y'all so this sexy little piece of priest was just going about his job in um preschool and he rises up to the top real fast on account of being so good looking well-mannered intelligent and also incredibly funny charming and good at his job so basically the total package babes he was also just the right amount of saucy, choosing to go against some of the typical doctrines of the church and also being openly critical of the policies of the Cardinal Richelieu. Blech. Oh my gosh, I speak French and that like gave me a little twist right there. Richelieu, oh my, I can't do it. Richelieu, there you go. We'll say it like that. Cardinal Richelieu. So Cardinal Richelieu was basically the Jafar to Louis the Thirteenth Sultan or the Rasputin to um, the Ramanoms, if you will. And that makes him sound totally evil. I know. I don't know too much about his actual policies, but he was a controversial figure, to be sure. And some people think that he was a total control freak egomaniac. And some people think that basically he just wanted a strong nation state baby. And if censorship of the free press and killing all your detractors was was wrong well that's just government for you boo hoo hoo <laughs> as a side note it was Rieslou's policies that set up the next Louis that was 14 to be the Sun King to outshine them all but we're getting off track here I'm just gonna say that Richelieu is the bad guy in the three musketeers and that's a good candy bar so do with that what you will all right so back to Grandier 
In 1617, Urbain Grandier became the parish priest of the Saint Pierre du Marche in Loudun, and all the ladies like to confess to him, if you know what I mean. Now, I'm not sure how <laughs> intimate these confessions got, but here's where we head towards straight up scandal. When Grandier, who became close friends with an important man about town named Louis Tranca, who was the king's prosecutor um, in Loudun. So as a favor for his buddy, Candier gave Latin lessons to Trincant's daughter. <laughs> well, something sus happened there, okay? Let me tell you about this. So the daughter became quote-unquote unwell for a period of months and was looked after by her friend whose name was Marth. So a suspicious amount of months later, Marth came out and she was like, yeah, I got a baby. Trincant was mad suspicious and he had Marth arrested and questioned and he was like, is that your baby? Is that your baby? And she was like, yeah, I told you I'm the mom, believe me. Uh, but basically no one believed that. Basically they thought that Grandier had seduced Trincant's daughter and then just bounced out pissing off the baby daddy-in-law, who again, I will mention, was an important prosecutor for the king. So. Besides this scandal, Harbin had made a few other enemies, suing some local priests. So one of them was this very vengeful guy whose name was Mignon. Uh, besides crushing this guy in court and starting a lifelong grudge, uh, Grandier was also reportedly very smug and cocky about the whole thing, which combined with his quick rise up the church career ladder really rubbed people the wrong way. And uh, then he also made Mignon's uncle mad, and it was a big, scary, I'm just gonna say crime family, so like, not smart there, dude. And then mix that in with some jealous husbands and some suspicious fathers around town and a rumor that circulated that not only had this bad boy priest been messing around out of wedlock, but he was actually, oh wait for it, secretly married. And given that Grandier had written something before that was like, hey, you guys don't really think that it's realistic for Catholic priests to be unmarried and celibate, right? Uh, yeah, he, w he probably was married. He probably was fooling around, but I don't know. Uh, basically... He made uh, some more enemies, including this guy called Minot, who was the king's council member and another big friend of the king. And um, he had this idea that the girl that he liked didn't like him back because she'd been in love or seduced by Grandier or married to him or something. It's unclear, but what is clear is that he had a grudge. Uh, so this is where things start getting wild. One of his enemies showed up to church and beat um, Grandier with a cane. So Grandier in turn went to the authorities and was like, hey, can y'all do something about this? Because people are being mad, jealous, and haters are going, hey. But the church and state were two totally separate things in this period of French history, so they couldn't really do too much. So he went straight to the king and was like, hey, Louis. Can you help me out here? And the king was like, okay, buddy, but like go to this court in Paris or whatever, make your case. So Grandier went to Paris. He was prepping for his court date there while his enemies decided to move behind his back and were just like, let's throw everything out there on the table. So they accused Grandier of lewdness, debauchery, and getting it on in the church itself. Um, they also got some of the jealous boys around town to testify against Grandier. And this play, this case, by the way, was being handled somewhere completely different. It was not in Paris. Uh, Grandier did not know about it. So when he showed back up in his town, he was arrested. And he was put in jail for two months, waiting for this big, like, media circus of a trial. However, with the principal charge being debauchery, he won the trial because there were no ladies who came forward saying that they'd been debauched. And some of the witnesses even retracted their statements and said that they had been bribed. And so the church judge was like, hey, buddy, I'm going to let these uh, charges of lewdness and lack of chastity slide. And his punishment was basically like, hey, you can only eat the lamest meal on Friday. So just water and bread for you on Fridays for a while. Uh, and uh, some people think that he got off easy because in the old time Catholic church, uh, fashion, that guy also had a secret wife on the side and did not want to let like any wild precedents happen like just in case so the result of all of this drama was basically just that Gandhi was found innocent and uh, his allies were like hey you should leave this town and go work on somewhere somewhere else you've got too many enemies here and this dumb bunny was like nah I've proved my innocence I've got my god given right to stay so I'm gonna stay I'm gonna flex on my haters and this is where the convent comes in 
So down the road in Ludan, there was a convent that had a job opening for a director because the last guy had died less than a year into the job. So this convent was an interesting place in general. Number one, because people thought it was like mad haunted. So that's fun. Uh, it had been sold to the nuns for crazy cheap because the townspeople were like, religion will scare away the ghosts. Woohoo! Uh, another interesting fact for context is that there were just a few older nuns and there were a lot of younger nuns and the younger ones kind of like to prank the older ones by pretending to see ghosts and pretending to be possessed or haunted or whatever. And the mother superior was in fact crazy young. She was 25. Apparently she'd been sent to nun school for being like a naughty little girl, but had then charmed the last mother superior and politicked herself real good into a position of power. Um, but anyways, all these sons were deprived with a lot of interaction with the outside world and they became obsessed with what they did know about. And what they did know about was local hottie, thotty celebrity or bon grandier. So, the mother superior asked him to come be the confessor or the director or whatever the job opening was there. And I mean, like, that makes sense, right? Because, like, why would you not want the hot celebrity bad boy priest to be your confessor when you're a naughty little nun? I get it. I would have done the same. Try to get some good times rolling in the convent, if you know what I'm saying. Anyways, she wrote him. She asked him to come take over the job. And your boy said, nah, he was too busy. This turned out to be a very bad idea. Besides pissing off the mother superior, she then wrote to Mignon and offered him the job. So Mignon, I mentioned earlier, he is the one who hates Urban Grandier, like enemy number one. And he was enraged that not only was he second choice for this job, but the first choice had been uh, Grandier and not him. So then things start to get really sus. Uh, Mignon realized that he could be the if he could be the guy who like vanquishes the ghost from the convent He's gonna be like super Catholic famous and admired for his holiness So guess what he takes over and the hauntings actually begin to increase and the mother superior begins telling people how she's been having dreams of Grandier coming to her in her sleep trying to get her to do sexy things and the gossip began to circulate after a few months Mignon recruited another priest to help him Another priest who was desperate for the reputation of like super duper holiness and who was also prone to visions and like being in a weird frame of mind, just like melancholy disposition. So his name was Pierre Barr. So we have Mignon and Barr uh, and they are basically conspirators who get to work. Before long, it is really well known gossip that the whole sisterhood is like possessed and the person who caused the possessions is Urban Grandier who sold his soul to Satan to become the hottest, smartest boy in town. So with this hot gas swirling, Mignon and Barr write to some other people to come in and judge the case. And they're like, hey, yo, come check out our nuns. We swear they're possessed. You want to see? So the investigators show up and they hear the claims that the women are seeing apparitions and they've been possessed for weeks. Um, they, they tell the investigators that this one chick has got like seven demons in her. And Mignon says he's got the demons' names figured out and like he knows where they're hiding in her body and all this stuff. And, um, you know, they bring the nun in. She starts to convulse. She writes around she squeals like a pig according to the records and Mignon tells the investigators that the nun doesn't know Latin but like all the demons can speak all the languages and he's like look I'll talk to this nun in Latin and I, I promise she doesn't know it so he starts an interrogation and in this interrogation the quote-unquote possessed nun reveals that is Urban Grandier who is the one who set the demon and after this show <laughs> Mignon was like, I don't know if they're convinced. So he was like talking to them after the nun had left. And he was like, hey, you guys know that um, that other case where the suspected ma magician was burned at the stake, right? And he was way too obvious. And they were like, okay, like that's red flags. Like you're you're bringing up be burning him at the stake already. Like what what is this? So <laughs> the result was that Mignon, his hatred of Grandier so well known, was now forbidden from doing exorcisms without an official present. He he was like, I'll try bro, but you never know with these demons, okay? So without going into the detail of every single like possession, some real suspicious stuff started happening. Like Mignon starts being like, okay, officials come by like around three. Um, I bet the demons will be very active again though. So of course the officials show up on three and like right on cue, women seem to get possessed. 
some other stories like fall apart with the the mother superior says like oh I can't remember anything that happens while I'm possessed but then later somebody asked her again and she's like oh yeah this is exactly what happened there's another time when there's a black cat like that walked innocently by and Barr was like hey it's the devil and one of the servants was like hm, it's just my cat please don't hurt it so that was embarrassing. Uh, things were really getting out of control, though. Like, this was all spiraling around town. Everybody knew about it. And Grandier could not really ignore the slander because it, basically all these people are pretending to be possessed and then naming him as a magician in league with the devil. So he couldn't just, like, sit there and keep doing nothing. Because at first he wasn't worried, but then he was like, uh-oh. This is bad. So he went to the bailiff. He asked for the nuns to be separated and sequestered and then examined by impartial parties because Mignon's grudge was well known against him. But Mignon's efforts were working and basically the net of conspiracy was closing around Grandier. He had to make an official complaint. Meanwhile, we take a look at some of the more more details of the possessions like th there are a lot of them if you want to read more about them you can find this I'll, I'll link it in the description but okay so here's some fun stories like demons were supposed to be able to speak any language in front of witnesses Barr was interrogating one of the quote-unquote possessed nuns and she messed up her Latin and people in the room actually started laughing because she got it so wrong and one of the interrogators tried to like speak to her in Greek and she couldn't answer a Scottish guy was like hey say this word in gaelic demon yeah the demon didn't know it because there wasn't a demon <laughs> and um some of the answers were also fumbled because clearly they had been rehearsed so there was an uh, interrogation in exchange with latin that was like the priest was like what's the name of this demon and the nun was like urban grandier and he was like <clears throat> i think you meant to tell me your name demon not the name of the person you who possessed you right or who got you possessed and she was like oh yeah totally that's what i meant so eventually the demons wised up and that's quote unquote demons they wised up and they would tell outsiders that they were like tired of questions that they were being too nosy and this made the inquisitors like crack up they told Barr like hey you know these girls are messing with you right but i think Barr may not have been in on the conspiracy maybe he wanted to believe it even after it was proven that the demons like barely knew latin he kept making excuses for reasons why they didn't want to talk to to anybody else in Greek or Hebrew or like the languages that any real demon should know, obviously. Uh, in a moment that was truly sitcom worthy, the lies were catching up with the mother superior who was the one who was like, I don't know Latin, I promise. Well, the thing was she definitely spoke some Latin as part of her regular nun duties and when she got called out on this, she was like, oh, I don't have to answer if I'm possessed right now. And so she fell into like convulsions to like, fake demon attack and then while she was pretending to be possessed by a demon there was another whammy of embarrassment because in addition to knowing all the languages demons were by common knowledge supposed to be able to tell you where anything was at any time so someone was like hey demon where is grandier right now and she's like oh uh he's at the castle but she got it so wrong because the bailiff had told grandier to wait at this place and he was waiting there for hours with witnesses so super easy to confirm that that was just like straight up made up. So the whole possession thing was beginning to look like a setup because it was. Grundy's official complaint kind of worked. The Archbishop of Archbishop of Bordeaux came by to intervene. Basically, as soon as he got there, the nuns stopped their possessions uh, for a period of time and left Mignon and Bar looking like big dumb idiots. Um, and the archbishop talked to talked to Grandier and was like, hey, you need to leave this town, my man. There is like literally nothing here for you. You've got so many enemies, nothing but haters. Like, you gotta go. But Grandier did not, and this would prove to be both an incredibly cocky and an incredibly stupid decision. So skip to the height of Richelieu's power, where Grandier's enemies see a real good chance to finally get rid of him. So 1633, Richelieu sends his man to Ludum for like unrelated reasons, but while he's there, Richelieu's guy received an invitation to go visit the famous convent where the nuns put on a show for him, convulsing, pretending to be possessed. So this was all the am ammunition that Grandier's enemies needed, and Richelieu launched an official church investigation and preemptively arrested Grandier to prevent him from fleeing. Accusations started to arise again with people saying that they'd seen Grandier at the convent at all hours of the night and day without knowing how he got inside, and for four months, Grandier was kept in prison while outside the 
slander against him was only growing. More and more people were claiming that he's a magician who sent Satan against them. I mean, it was like the new TikTok trend. So the investigation is totally a scam. It's like a farce is being made of sending in expert investigators, but like none of the experts were actually experts. And in fact, coincidentally, a lot of them were related to Grandier's enemies. And while in prison, Grandier was actually subjected to some torture, there was something like they were like, hey, he's got these demon marks on his flesh that will hurt when they're pressed. So to get him to react, they stripped him and put him on a table and they made this contraption where they could get him to scream at the right time by hiding a needle in like a tube that was controlled with a spring. So they would like pass it without the needle over his body and then when they got to like the devil marks, which I assume were just moles or something, they activated the spring, stabbing him deeply. And he like cried out the first time, but then he seemed to have been able to be like, whole, like grit his teeth and not, not scream when they stabbed him again because they did stab him like five times. And another mockery of due process was made because the church was like, hey, you got, we're going to prove, or sorry, the convent was like, we're going to prove that these possessions are real. Come by the church, like 7 p.m. The demons, y'all, they're going to be levitating some stuff. Like these guys are going to try to hold these, these nuns down and the demons are going to overpower them or something like that. Uh, but people got to the church and there were enough skeptics that they were like, I mean, they're asking us to go at night. That's suspicious. And people started looking around and guess what? They found that there was like some, some wires and hooks being set up in the roof to like pull things up. And the, the people who were supposed to hold the nuns down were like plants. And this other guy was like, I'll hold her down. And then the girl tried to convulse. And of course the demon could not overpower the guy. And so like, basically everybody was like okay you guys are framing him like it is clear you're framing him this is a, this is totally a scam uh and in fact one of the nuns at least one confessed that she was like no longer interested in trying to frame him and she tried to in her own life out of guilt but she was not successful so how did he end up being killed basically richelieu had signed an order that forbade the state from intervening in the trial this was church business and the church wanted him dead um and that's the way the, the government was separated back in 1600s france so they tortured him quite brutally we're not we're gonna gloss over that and they burned him alive at the stake um what is remarkable is that even though they tortured him grandier did not confess to any of the charges so that's the end of the story uh it's another supernatural quote unquote supernatural encounter that basically involved nothing more than framing somebody who pissed off the wrong people because history is cruel dude and people got away with basically like all kinds of stuff back then and probably still do. But anyways, if you thought this was interesting, I'm going to refer you to a link in the description, which is my biggest source on this trial. So it's a book by Alexandre Dumas, the Elder, and it contains a lot of details about all the possessions. This was written basically like 200 years or so after this it all happened, so it's even closer in history than we are today. And I also found this French book from the 1700s, but it's in French. I'll link it if you want to read it, but I don't know how many of y'all can read French. But read the Dumas. It's, it's pretty comprehensive and goes into a lot of detail about all the uh, possessions. So so that's my video. I hope you like this magic school. Subscribe to my channel if you like this and uh, hope to see you again soon.